Hello, this is Tim Congdon, Chair of the Institute of International Monetary Research at the University of Buckingham. It's uh, October 2022, and uh, this video is about it's a monthly update on money and macro, the kind that I, I do for the Institute. And this particular session is very much about macroeconomics and fiscal policy rather than money. It's a bit, a bit different from normal. And I'm going to be uh, focusing on Britain rather than talking more globally and uh, about a number of economies. Um, but the message and the analysis are in fact relevant for all economies. Um, I'm going to be talking about the, in particular, the dynamics of public debt and then uh, coming back to the UK, showing why what's happened um, in the last few weeks uh, with the Kwarteng uh, mini budget and um, other developments now he's been sacked, um, trying to explain um, the underlying theory uh, that's relevant here. Okay, so let's just start off from a very simple point, which is that public spending has two elements. It has interest on the public debt and all other kinds of public spending. Now, interest on the debt is a transfer between bondholders and taxpayers. If they all belong to the same nation, in a sense, it's um, taxing Peter to pay Peter. Um, it's not actually anything very productive or worthwhile. And yet, we have to pay taxes in order for the government to pay debt interest. And those taxes have the usual effects on incentives, and they distort the economy. So uh, we can think about public spending as being split between this um, wasteful, pointless uh, debt interest and the rest of public spending, spending, which for the most part is worthwhile. Surely, public policy should be organised in order to minimise debt interest. OK, now let's just look at, um, to get some sort of sense of, of the, what's been happening on this front in recent years in Britain. This shows you the relative size of debt interest, a little bit at the bottom, and other public spending. And you can see that uh, the debt interest component is very small in recent years compared with worthwhile public spending. That's a good thing. Uh, and indeed, over the last few years, the ratio of debt interest to total public spending has come down a lot. This chart finishes in 2020, when we had COVID. Many economists expected years and years of falling prices, or at least disinflation. And so interest rates were very, very low. Bond yields were also very, very low. And that kept down the ratio of debt interest to total public spending. Excellent. Unfortunately, this, this particular chart doesn't cover the period for 21, 22, 23, 24, when I'm afraid uh, the development of debt interest is going to be pretty horrific in the UK. It's going to rise very, very sharply, perhaps even above the highest figures in this chart. Let's now try and think about this subject more in the abstract. I will come back to reality and politics and what's been going on in the recent, in recent weeks towards the end of the uh, video, but I want just now to make some key points about where we're going. Just think about a nation that's got um, a, maybe it's a little bit of debt, it's got no inflation, and it's got public spending. And let's suppose that there's no trend growth of output at all. Let's suppose and start, for example, with a, a balanced budget or anyway, a small budget deficit. And let's suppose that in this nation, the finance minister decides to cut taxes 
No changes in spending relative to GDP to cut taxes. Then obviously the effect is to increase the budget deficit. If there's a balanced budget before, to establish a budget deficit. That increases the debt. That increases the interest on the debt. And the interest on the debt is itself part of public spending. So the ratio of debt interest to GDP is higher than before as a result of the unfunded tax cuts. And in fact, the situation is explosive because as the budget deficit continues, the debt keeps on rising, the, de the debt interest keeps on rising, and so the whole thing just runs out of control. Now, just repeat, the debt interest is itself wasteful, pointless, has the same distorting effects as other taxes, assuming it's paid for by taxes as it has to be in the end of the day. Now, of course, you might say this is not fair, because in the real world, there's economic growth. And then I'm going to just develop here a very simple argument. I'm sorry, it's a bit of algebra, but it's a very simple argument that I first discussed uh, in a book uh, that I wrote and came out in 1988. This is a very well-known argument. Um, it's, it's basic to the understand, understanding the dynamics of public debt. Suppose that um, there's a, a, we've got a growing economy now, but there's a budget deficit. And the budget deficit has got two bits. It's got the interest payments on the debt. We can put this into a bit of algebra. As a, that's the I, the little, little I is the interest rate, and D is the debt. Plus, um, what you might call the primary balance, which is the level of the deficit, possibly a surplus, where we uh, deduct all spending except debt interest from taxation. If spending excluding debt interest exceeds taxation, there's a deficit, a primary deficit. So this is an expression for the budget deficit. Budget deficit is the change in the debt, little d against big D. And the growth rate of the debt is where we divide the change in the debt by the debt itself. And you can see that that's equal to the primary deficit divided by the debt plus the rate of interest. Now then, let's take this on a little bit more. It's obvious that the, that's the growth rate of the debt, that the growth rate that the debt is growing faster than GDP if the primary deficit divided by the debt plus the interest rate is higher than the growth rate of the economy. Assuming away inflation, so we're talking about the trend growth rate of real output against the interest rate on the debt. In other words, if a country has, say, a primary balance, taxation equals all government spending, excluding debt interest payments, the debt will explode if the interest rate on the debt exceeds the growth rate of the economy. That's the key message that comes out from all this. But another way, um, if the interest rate uh, on the debt is equal to the growth rate of the economy and the nation runs a primary deficit, again, the debt explodes. Now then, let's come back to the real world. The interest rate on the debt in most economies in the very long run has to be positive to give savers a proper return, okay? And if you ask people what the normal long run kind of return on, on government debt ought to be, most economists would say 3% looking over the last two or 300 years. At present, the growth rate of real output, trend growth rate of real output in most European countries, 1%, not much more than that. Productivity growth in Europe was more or less stopped in the last decade. There still is some employment growth, much of it because of Im immigration, but the growth rate of trend output is very low. The growth rate is less than the interest rate on the debt. Governments must watch their finances very carefully. They mustn't run large budget deficits. Okay, 
It's true enough that um, in uh, uh, 2020 we had a very low interest rate, but that isn't the situation now. There is, you might say, there are two kind of there are two ways of overcoming the logic I've just been talking about. One way is to inflate. One way is for the government to organize, perhaps in cahoots with the central bank, a high inflation rate, which reduces the real value of the debt. And this, I'm afraid, is what the British government did um, in the first 30 years after the Second World War. And indeed, many governments have done this over the years. It's the kind of thing that one associates more with Latin America than with a European country. Um, but there are risks of this kind of thing everywhere. Um, obviously, in Germany, today, often regarded as a, as a model of, of good finance, of strong finance, there was, of course, the Weimar Viper, in, uh, Heimer, the, 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 the Weimar hyperinflation of 1923. Well, the problem with using inflation to wipe out the debt is that the uh, um, financial markets don't like it, understandably, because the real value of the investments is being reduced. So what's happened in Britain uh, since uh, the summer of 2020 is that the yield on 10-year gilts has increased from next to nothing, about a quarter of percent, 25 basis points, up to over 4%, 400 basis points, um, and indeed in some recent trading sessions, over 4.5%. Uh, and so the, the uh, interest rate on the debt um, has risen um, over 16, 17 times. That then feeds back to the debt interest bill. That is part of the current crisis. And you can see in this chart that much of this surge in the uh, yield on the 10-year gilts has occurred in the last few weeks, just as the trust government has taken power. And this reflects the, the loss of confidence uh, that, that has occurred. The um, other way of trying to deal with this um, problem is a kind of theory, a kind of hypothesis, that is associated with supply-side economics in the United States. According to this, this theory, if taxes are cut, this will boost the trend growth rate of the economy so much that this will lead to buoyancy in tax revenues and keep the budget deficit down. Now, this idea has been peddled to uh, uh, Liz, Liz Truss, the Prime Minister, and also to Kwasi Kwarteng, the former Chancellor of the Exchequer. Um, and um, I'm afraid there's no evidence for it. I mean, if it were true, that what it would mean is that the larger the budget deficit a country runs, the higher the trend growth rate of output. If this were true, there would never be any economic problem. It isn't true. It's nonsense. There are sometimes references to the supply side revolution uh, in uh, the United States during the Reagan presidency. I'm sorry, the public debt ratio in the United States in the early 1980s was very low at around about 30%. And then at the end of the Reagan presidency, it was 50%. The Reagan tax cuts led to a sharp increase in the American public debt relative to GDP. Sure enough, it's much higher today than it was then. Um, but it didn't, certainly there was no evidence in the Reagan years of the debt coming under control in the way that the supply siders believe. Now, these kind of problems are not new. Um, the, uh, uh, um, the Thatcher government had to deal with these sort of issues back in the 1980s. Britain in the first 30 years after the, first, after the Second World War had uh, a high inflation rate peaking in 1975 at 27%. And the yield on bonds wasn't 25 basis points or 400 basis points or even 450 basis points. It was 16% plus, uh, 1,600 basis points, if you please. At that time in the late 70s, the debt was being issued at these sort of interest rates 
both on newly issued debt to finance the ongoing budget deficit and also to replace maturing debt. So the tendency was for the ratio of debt interest to rise relative to GDP. And um, in the late 70s and early 80s, there are very many serious worries about Britain's fiscal solvency. Now, the way this was handled uh, was um, for the Thatcher government to be very strongly committed to getting the ratio of debt and debt interest under control. And in 1981, there was the so-called, uh, there was this budget, uh, the 1981 budget, which increased taxes by 2% of GDP in a recession. This shocked many economists because it seemed to contradict basic Keynesian economics, but it was done in order essentially uh, to bring the public finances under control in the medium term. One of the fears at that time was that a large budget deficit might be financed to some extent from the banking system leading to monetary growth, leading to monetary growth and the worry about monetary growth was it would lead to too much inflation. So the 1981 budget was an exercise in Thatcherite monetarism. So let's then compare that with what's just happened uh, with the Kwasi Kwarteng's special fiscal event uh, on the 23rd of September. Um, we had a 2% cut in taxes as a share of GDP without any comparable reduction in public spending, unfunded tax cuts. There was no statement about what this meant about public finances over the medium term. This was not at all an exercise in uh, Thatcherite economics. It was the opposite of that. It was the antithesis, indeed, of Thatcherite monetarism. One might ask why all these things are going on. One of the advocates um, of unfunded tax cuts has been uh, Patrick Minford, an, a professor at the Cardiff Business School. He and I go back a long way because in the 1980s he was often touted as being a monetarist. It always surprised me this is the case. Um, but he's, he's really a supply sider. He really believes in this. Uh, if you cut taxes, then there's going to be faster growth of output and buoyancy in the tax revenue and all these supply side benefits so you don't have to worry about the medium-term fiscal solvency of, fisc of, of what's being done. Uh, he had an article in The Telegraph which actually recommended that uh, trustonomics, this sort of idea of supply-side tax cuts, should be taken even further. Apparently he wanted even more unfunded tax cuts. And Truss undoubtedly um, knows of Minford because she referred to him in a radio interview uh, some weeks back uh, in the uh, Conservative leadership election, the contest between Truss and Sunak. But let me just finally say that what that threat monetarism was about, I was very much a supporter of it, was the reductions in the rate of growth of money in order to reduce inflation and reductions in the budget deficit over the medium term to ensure fiscal solvency. That isn't what's happened in Britain in recent weeks. It's been a total disaster, and it's the antithesis of Thatcherite monetarism. Thank you.